everyone um and uh welcome uh to all of you katie just joined us uh from uh, perth um i'll make a start this is the first uh, uh, of our webinar series of the health economics and policy uh group uh, uh we are running pretty much one um uh, a seminar or webinar uh per month hoping to to resume uh, um uh, also the face-to-face, -face, not only the pure online, we will keep, of course, live streaming of those. Um, however, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to start this new um, uh, series that is really trying to understand better uh, the uh, decisions around vaccination um, and uh, uh, the title of today uh, uh, webinar and, and the following ones, it's uh, to vax or not to vax. Um, understanding attitudes towards uh, um, uh, uh, vaccination uh, for COVID-19. I'm very uh, pleased to uh, host this. I'm Francesco Paolucci. I'm a professor here at uh, University of Newcastle and uh, also University of Bologna uh, that are uh, co-branding um, um, uh, this together with uh, uh, CIFA here at UN um, and uh, the Hunter Research uh, foundation um, center. Um, we uh, are very pleased to have a great uh, 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 lineup of, of uh, panelists or speakers uh, uh, today, all the way from Melbourne, uh, Professor uh, Anthony uh, Scott, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, and has been for, for me personally for a very long time one of my uh, favorite health uh, economists. Uh, I was reading it and doing my studies and, and then I came to Australia and he was leading an excellent um, program. Uh, uh, I, I still hope it's called the Health and Healthcare uh, Research Team at the Melbourne Institute. Um, uh, and uh, obviously the Melbourne Institute uh, has uh, been doing great work uh, uh, across a number of, of important areas. And um, uh, uh, clearly uh, Anthony in his capacity in the past also as president of the Australian Health Economic Society and the board in the board uh, director of the uh, International Health Economics Association has uh, really uh, contributed uh, to uh, uh, the progress, the, the progress really of health economics uh, uh, as a whole here uh, uh, in Australia. Um, ECV is very uh, uh, long and impressive with uh, many contributions uh, to the literature on uh, a number of behavioral topics, incentives. Uh, uh, performance uh, across a, a range of sectors within um, uh, healthcare um, and uh, currently and for a while um, uh, at, at Melbourne they're running um, a very important um, uh, survey uh, to understand uh, um, a better employment uh, and life balance. So welcome uh, Anthony, I hope my uh, presentation um, uh, uh, you know was uh, comprehensive enough uh, and if I miss something that it's important please mention because we are all here to know uh, what, what's going on. Um, uh, I'm very uh, thrilled to have my ex-colleague and um, uh, uh, very uh, uh, respected collaborator um, uh, Professor Katie Atwell. Uh, Katie is uh, uh, I would call uh, a very uh, 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 very much, I, I think, a, a top expert in, in this area. Uh, she has a, a social science uh, background. When I met her um, uh, quite a while ago, now I can't remember exactly, but uh, we are around maybe a decade ago, uh, she uh, was starting to, to become distinctively interested in uh, vaccination, vaccination uptake problems, vaccination hesitancy. And we started discussing this because uh, Italy went through a number of years ago uh, quite interesting questions around ma ma mandates for, um, uh, let's call classic vaccines. Uh, and uh, 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 clearly, uh, she has been uh, very central to uh, work done in this area, not only in uh, Australia, but globally, um, and uh, uh, definitely uh, pivotal to uh, the work of Co COSI, uh, which is the collaboration of social science and uh, innovation. And she has a very wide range uh, of uh, uh, collaborations uh, uh, with journals uh, and uh, organizations and individuals uh, in in this uh, uh, area. So welcome, um, uh, Katie. Similar, uh, uh, of course. If you have, if I forgot something, uh, please uh, uh, let us know. Uh, we are eager to know uh, what 
uh, you're up to. Um, uh, then finally, uh, we have Professor uh, uh, Bartlett. Um, Nathan is uh, a colleague of mine here at the University of Newcastle HMRI based. Um, I suppose that's the uh, full range of uh, uh, your uh, affiliations, uh, Nathan. And uh, Nathan is, uh, uh, has been uh, uh, very uh, much at the for forefront uh, uh, of science and I would say discovery. Uh, and uh, we're really uh, eager to, to hear more about uh, your work in nasal spray. Uh, uh, clinical trials, uh, successes, and of course, lessons. Uh, clearly, is one of the key uh, experts uh, in uh, 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 the evolving landscape in re respiratory uh, problems, and of course, uh, virus-related uh, and uh, the related drug development. Uh, similar to the others, uh, very eminent uh, speakers, uh, uh, Nathan has a very uh, impressive and, and long uh, CV uh, is, is a real leader in this space. Uh, I'm very happy to have you uh, today with us uh, and uh, uh, to participate in our discussion. So welcome, Nathan, as well. And as, as well, if I didn't mention something, let me know. I'm trying to really limit the presentations because I really am eager to get to uh, the topic of today. So to vax or not to vax? We decided this title, which we think it's not uh, really provocative, uh, uh, anymore because it's been discussed left, right, and center, read in uh, media outlets. Uh, 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 politicians speak, speak about vaccinations uh, and hesitancy and uptake, like uh, they were talking uh, about uh, uh, election items uh, 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 in other eras. So now, uh, starting from, from Nathan, like I, I would really like to, to have uh, uh, a very basic questions to kind of set the tone in the debate. What, can you tell us really what, what we mean by vaccination um, uh, to start with and also comment on uh, what you think really hesitancy uh, is about? I think there is a lot of uh, 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 terminologies floating around that create also expectations uh, in the public opinion and certainly uh, uh, it would be good to, to clarify what we're talking about uh, to start with. Nathan. Yeah, happy to do so, Francesco, and hello, everybody. Um, happy to be here. And look, uh, vaccination began in 1796 when a chap by the name of Edward Jenner decided to inject um, some material from a, a cowpox lesion um, from a milkmaid. Uh, they'd noticed that um, milkmaids didn't appear to be susceptible to a very nasty human uh, infectious disease of the time called smallpox, which fortunately we're not familiar with because of vaccines. Uh, however, this was the first attempt to vaccinate somebody, uh, that is to in inject something into them that would instruct their immune system and provide uh, you know, durable protection from the disease that you're targeting. I guess a lot of people probably don't know where the term comes from. Um, vaca is actually Latin for cow. And um, I guess some of the more Latin speaking um, people in our audience might recognize that, um, but certainly us English speakers probably don't know that. Um, so it is, yes, yeah, Latin for cow. And it really, as I said, it comes from um, the fact that cowpox was the initial source of vaccine um, that was used uh, for, for smallpox. And so it was called um, vaccination, so it was uh, derived from this this cowpox material. So, and and even when this showed stunning protective effects at the time, um, it immediately aroused uh, an anti-vax sentiment. So even at that point, when such an awful, horrendous disease was was being um, prevented by this effective approach it still provoked uh, an anti-vax um, movement. Um, people believing you should use different, more natural approaches. I guess the idea of sticking a, a sticking material from a, from a, from a cowpox lesion into your arm was, was difficult to accept, <laughs> I can imagine at the time. I mean, indeed, I think the, that really speaks to a more generalized, um, uh, I guess, feeling amongst many that it is difficult to accept that vaccines work. I mean, it, they seem quite almost miraculous in some ways, don't they? And that might be part of why many don't believe it or, or, or struggle to accept it. 
Um, and so this is something that's been around for a long time or well, since the beginning of vaccination too. So but that's what vaccination is. That's where it comes from. Um, um, and of course, it's proven to be an incredibly effective approach for preventing many um, otherwise devastating infectious diseases. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, moving to uh, Katie first and then um, Anthony. So Katie, uh, uh, obviously, we, we'd like to, to introduce us to um, the concept of hesitancy, right, from a social science perspective, obviously. Um, and now we heard uh, that that comes from very far, but it has evolved and certainly it has uh, uh, absorbed different connotations. Can you can you get us through quickly? Oh, wait, wait, quickly. No, take your time, please. Yeah. Uh, please uh, uh, unmute. Sorry, looking a bit green there, not unmuting myself. Um, so yeah, the concept of hesitancy has been an interesting development and journey that, you know, I believe has had some pretty far reaching and negative um, consequences. I think if, you know, if you asked everyone who's here in this webinar today, what they understood vaccine hesitancy to mean, they would assume that it meant some form of reticence towards being vaccinated. And either that some, and, and they might also understand that it would be on a spectrum. There might be some people who were like, oh, I'm a bit worried, but I'll, I'll probably do it. Or right to the, you know, far end of that spectrum being the people who are, you know, out on the streets, anti-vaccinationists, um, you know, mobilising others, keyboard warriors, misinformation spreaders, etc. cetera. Um, so we would have a kind of understanding that hesitancy was an attitudinal um, domain, that it was something that, pertained to what somebody thinks or feels about vaccinating. And that's how I use the term, and that's how I believe we should use the term. But um, about 10 years ago, the World Health Organization put together a committee to um, investigate this kind of nascent problem that their intelligence sources were picking up, which was that there seemed to be people refusing vaccinations in contexts where vaccines were available. And that's, that's a bit of a novel WHO problem because, you know, the WHO and the, 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 you know, the people, the sort of field experts of many years, um, you know, the biggest problem they were used to dealing with was like, how do we get vaccines to all these people that need them? How do we help poor and developing countries, you know, reach their populations? And the populations generally want to be vaccinated. So this idea that you might have people who can but don't want to was a problem they wanted to investigate and they were, you know, the term, the term hesitancy was already being bandied about, so that seemed like the term they would go after. But when the working group, which was made up of some vaccination social scientists and some other experts got together, they ended up making a decision to, and that they did it through, and I've kind of done some forensic process tracing of what they did, um, but I won't go into that much detail. They ended up making a decision that was important, and that was, they decided that they didn't want people to lose focus on the role of the state and how it's really important that, that systems, that vaccination systems reach people. In other words, it's not just up to the individual to accept vaccinations. Governments need to design systems that reach people. They need to create access that people can get to. They need supply. So they ended up developing this very comprehensive, multi-factorial and kind of like catch-all so that vaccine hesitancy from their definition came to mean pretty much any reason somebody's not vaccinated. And crucially, they included in that the concept of convenience. So they had three Cs, which were confidence. Yes, I need to be confident in the vaccine. So that's back to me and my attitude. Then they had complacency. And again, so that's back to my attitude. I need to actually be ready to and, and, and want to do this and turn up. But convenience, I'm not vaccine hesitant if, I, if there's not a clinic near me. That's not my problem. That's actually a government problem. So the people who kind of put this definition together kind of knew all this and they understood all of it. But what happened was they then kind of launched this, the three C's and vaccine hesitancy out into the world. And what followed was a lot of very bad research and a lot of very bad kind of experiences of countries and individuals and, and researchers trying to understand un, non-vaccination as a problem. And people would do studies where they would go like, and, and, and they would be like, oh yeah, you know, like there's no, there's no vaccine here and like people can't get it. There's lots of hesitancy problems here. And it's like, no, <laughs> it's not. So it's become this like kind of terminological problem. Um, 
I've written about this. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to send you um, some papers. I've written, recently wrote a piece about it in Nature where we're trying to now kind of correct that discourse and focus on, yeah, hesitancy is a problem, but it's also a problem about what governments, like the problem is also what, what are governments doing? And I'm not hesitant if government isn't reaching me. And by the way, I'm also, and, and then we've pushed it further and said, well, it's not just that I'm not hesitant if government isn't reaching me, but actually it's also government's job to motivate me. And it's also government's job to make me want to vaccinate because otherwise vaccinating is weird and creepy. So I'm, I'm now coming from a very, very position of, um, well, a real position of like centralizing the role of the state and, and the role of the systems in this and saying, it's their job to activate everybody. It's their job to reach everybody. It's their job to overcome barriers, whether those are barriers of acceptance or whether those are barriers of access. It's, it's the government's job. Let's stop talking about this being, you know, an individual hesitancy problem. So that said, the definition that I would give of, of hesitancy um, is somebody, and, and this is what I think we're actually really here to talk about, is people who kind of are actively choosing not to vaccinate or not to vaccinate fully or not to have all of their doses of COVID vaccine or not get, not have boosters, you know, they're, they're choosing that. And then of course it gets into the question of, well, why, what are the factors, blah, blah, blah. But that's probably the next, the next thing you might yeah. want me to talk about. Thank you, Katie. Very good. So, um, uh, Anthony, uh, Professor Scott, uh, uh, to follow up on this now, um, uh let's let's think as 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 an economist like like uh, uh i think what comes to mind here um uh, is a, is a little bit uh uh the 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 the, the, uh, the surprise that maybe many um have been um, uh feeling when when hearing about uh hesitancy in a very uh, lay way it's been very politicized in some countries more than others of course but fundamentally, it's, it's a behavioral issue, and um, um, uh, and uh, it's a choice, as, as Katie discussed. And um, of course, I'd like to hear from you what you think about that uh, in, in itself. But what interests me uh, from an economic perspective is uh, um, the approach the government took towards uh, uh, hesitancy in general. I mean, uh, in some countries. Uh, almost uh, uh, or, or almost exclusively, the discussion has been around mandates. Whereas we know that that there are other tools that uh, uh, might encourage individuals to uh, positively take up uh, and, and evaluate this, their decision in one way or the other, like incentives and, and so on. So, what are your thoughts about how we went about this? Uh, uh, whether it, it's been a, a, a efficient, whether it was well motivated, but anyway. What's there to say about hesitancy responses? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, um, I mean, there's a number of things there uh, um, to pick up on. Um, I guess uh, as a health economist, I'm interested in people's behaviour um, and uh, and how we change that. Particularly with, with vaccinations, this is a kind of what we call a classic externality problem in, in healthcare where, um, you know, the... the um, your own dis because your decision to get vaccinated or not affects others um, because of spreading the disease. Um, if if everybody's left to themselves to do it their own decisions, vaccinations would be underprovided, and therefore governments need to step in to, to supply vaccinations and persuade people to kind of go. So there's a an economic argument for government intervention as well in this kind of particular market, if you like. Um, now. Um, but I think that, you know, the government response is how they go about increasing vaccination. And, and as Katie said, there's things about supply and access. There's things about changing people's behavior and attitudes. And um, even if there's lots of supply around, everything's accessible, if people don't want to do it, how are government's going to change that? Those, the policy responses to that depends on the reasons why. <laughs> people don't want to be vaccinated. And, and so I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, before COVID, I hadn't done any research on vaccination at all. And I'm sure Katie and Nathan have got a lot more expertise on general reasons for not getting vaccinated. And some of those reasons carried over into, uh, in, in, into COVID, certainly. It was a different context. Um, it, it was a different kind of pandemic to, to previous ones, I guess, and, and again, 
quite different to kind of, I guess, the usual childhood immunization vaccination schedules that everybody do. And there's been a lot of research done on that in terms of hesitancy. So I think, you know, that the government responses generally depend on, on what people, uh, in, in terms of how you want to change people's um, attitudes and behavior. And that depends on why. So I think, you know, um, there are um, there are different kinds of policies um, that, that, that can kind of either uh, try to change people's beliefs and information about what they hold. So that's where people, and you know, our research showed that, that another researcher showed that, that the main reason for vaccine hesitancy was was particularly last year um, was around lack of information on safety and effectiveness of vaccines or, or people weren't receiving that information or weren't receiving, I guess, unbiased information. And therefore one, one policy opportunity is to just give people information. So how do you go about that? So that there's lots of issues there about, you know, media campaigns or talk to your GPs or, or lots of other ways to kind of get information to people. And that's a, that, you know, there's been lots of work done on that as well. Um, and then I guess, um, you know, uh, for, for people who are kind of hesitant because they're kind of not sure, um, then you kind of might think of nudges and behavioral nudges that might just get people over the line. Um, and and that, that's, you know, um, in terms of incentives, there's, um, you know, different kinds of incentives. Um, that, that economists kind of tend to think about. Now, last year, um, obviously, we Victoria, New South Wales, back end of last year, were in quite harsh lockdowns, um, and uh, there was incentives in place that if we hit vaccination targets, those lockdowns would be lifted. So, to, in October, September, October, um, you know, vaccination rates were were going up quite quickly. Um, People wanted to get out of these lockdowns, so that might have got them vaccinated. Um, and those people were probably already kind of motivated, but just hadn't been organised enough to get it done, or, or, or may have been in the two minds, but decided to kind of do it. Um, also, last October, we had um, the million dollar vaccination competition, a kind of lottery, um, uh, which was introduced um, by a bunch of um, 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 philanthropic organisations. Um, there was a million dollar prize and there was also lotteries in the US which did this and the evidence on whether those lotteries work is quite mixed and those are probably more likely to work where people are, just need a nudge to get over the line or get vaccinated quicker than they already wise or already would have um, so there's those kind of things as well um, but I think you know a lot of the a lot of the social science research is about going into communities and really delving into why um, uh, they don't want to get vaccinated and, and their beliefs and then trying to change that through more kind of targeted education approaches. I guess what I've been talking about is kind of national policies where you want to try and make a big impact at scale. Um, whereas there's a whole other lot of stuff that I know much less about, about actually working with communities to try and um, get vaccination rates up. Tony, can I pick up on something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think you've raised a really important point certainly in Australia, where the first two immunizations, the uptake was incredibly high, you know, 95, 6%, you know, it's really demonstrated that given the right um, incentive, i.e. the lockdown, I think that lockdown, um, you know, stick rather than carrot type of deal, you get vaccinated, we'll let you out, had a huge impact on that. And, and I guess proved that many people who might have professed to having sort of fundamental idealistic problems with vaccination or other things when push came to shove and they were locked down and couldn't get out they were happy to get the happy to get the vaccine but were able to do that and get the vaccine yeah now and i guess now we're looking at the third booster where uptake is substantially lower of course we don't have the the threats of of lockdown hanging over our heads and that seems to change people's attitude drastically I think that's a really important observation. Um, I don't understand it anywhere near as probably Katie does, and I'd be very interested to hear why. Clearly, people were happy to get vaccinated at one point, but are no longer. Um, so what, what is that fundamental change about? 
Yeah, great. This is such a good conversation. So a um, couple of points to make. Um, we did some research here at University of Western Australia where we sampled, um, we spoke to student and staff cohorts about their thoughts on a vaccine mandate. And as part of that, it was cool. What else can we find out? Um, so one of the things we found out, in fact, was that there was, of the people who'd had two doses at the time that we surveyed them, 9% were either unsure or unwilling to have a third dose. So definitely what we've learned is that, and I think my, you know, my sum summation of that is that we were sold a two-dose course because uh, that's what the scientists thought at the time. And people, you know, and the, the vaccine hesitant and anti-vaccinationists were like, oh, they, you know, it's going to be a never-ending thing. They're going to need to, you know, dose you every month. And, you know, so I think there's a, a bit of concern that, like, where does this end? And also, oh, God, that you know, need, need another boost so soon. And, and you know, unfortunately, the vaccines haven't held up against Omicron as well as we would have liked, um, as well as they, you know, the immunity that they offer us wanes over time. So there's certainly something, yeah, my one key advice there is don't assume that because people were willing to have two, that they're willing to have three. The other point I'd make here is that from where I am in Western Australia, we have the most comprehensive vaccine mandates for employment in the country, and I believe perhaps in the world. Um, our vaccine mandates for employment um, as legislated by the government or as public health ordered by the government cover what's believed to be 75% of the workforce. Now, pretty early this year, while we were all waiting to reopen, I think it was, our government then brought in the, the public space need vaccination to go to the pub mandate, which was different from the scenario you guys were just talking about because that was the carrot, if you like, of like, hey, we're locked down, but if you want to get vaccinated, you get to be free. It was flipping it. It was like one minute you're free, the next minute, sorry, you're not coming in if you don't have the vaccine. So psychologically quite different, behaviourally quite a different feeling for people, a loss. Um, but then also, right, so our government during that time of the doing all that other stuff also said, oh, by the way, anyone who is now covered by those 75% mandates, it's now three doses. As soon as you're eligible, you got a month. So that's, you know, there's a reason WA has the highest booster rates, right? And I think it's, I think it's mandates. Yeah, yeah, but if people are going to lose a job <laughs> or can't work, that, that by that's the way, really big Yeah, and sorry just to, to jump in there, but we're doing research at the moment on, um, we're doing a qualitative study of vaccine hesitant people. And I was just talking to my research officer this morning who's doing those interviews. And she said, um, for people who have um, ultimately swallowed the vaccine against their will and wishes, really, it's always about the job. She said, you know, no one said, oh, I, I did it because I wanted to be able to go to the pub or I did it because I wanted to be able to go here or there. It's, it's employment mandates that seem to be the powerful thing. Absolutely. Good, great. This is a great follow-up um, to, to, to what uh, uh, I, I was planning um, to discuss. So obviously, you know, the countries, this has happened uh, not necessarily completely simultaneously uh, everywhere. Uh, including the responses of government. So now what you see in a number of countries, the US and other countries, uh, you, you see a, a rising amount of, of uh, uh, litigation uh, really based on exactly the things that we are discussing uh, now, right? So uh, a number of uh, the mandates in the US uh, imposed at the state level uh, are now uh, you know, being uh, under scrutiny. Some are in, in, uh, in courts. Uh, similar in uh, in uh, some European countries, I think Germany has been has been struggling for this for a very long time, even uh, with the question of whether they could impose a mandate or not. Um, and ultimately, you know, they tried to uh, uh, gently force it through, and and they kind of managed, but uh, with uh, um, apparently quite important, uh, uh, I would say, yeah, judicial repercussions at least uh, um, in terms of. Uh, not only the cost, but also the the, the, the social uh, uh, cost of it um, as well, because these, these are clearly uh, uh, very publicized public cases. Uh, so the, the, there is a, quite 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 a, a, an involvement of, of resources um, and public resources as well. Now, the, the the things that intrigue me is, of course, you know, there have been more or less different degrees uh, of, of responding to. Um, um, uh, the, the crisis and, and or organizing vaccinations, different um, uh, probably colors uh, or intensities of, of mandates uh, um, and so on. The, the one aspect that intrigues me is, is that um, 
uh, whether from uh, uh, a scientific perspective, from a practice perspective, or simply from an intuition perspective, you think there is, especially going forward, uh, given that you know we're talking about three here, uh, third doses in some countries, Israel and Chile, we're already maybe at the fifth. Um, uh, given that we're in an endemic situation by now, uh, what is going to be a sustainable way forward? Obviously, on, on, on the back side, you have litigation, which will end we don't know where, which is a complex matter because you know there are tensions um, uh, within uh, obligations and right. And obviously, on the one hand, you have people that say, look, this is public health. That's the end of that. But uh, should I be losing my job uh, if I don't get a vaccination? These are the, the real uh, brought to court matters. Uh, and, uh, uh, and on the other hand, yeah, we still have this, this problem. Uh, we're going to have more vaccines, likely. Um, uh, I am fully uh, vaccinated uh, three times, by the way, because it's always hard you know, to, to be the chair of these things. You, you, you might be uh, swinging a little bit uh, to try to make uh, this very basic point. I would like to start with Anthony, if he, if he likes. Uh, really, what, what is it uh, that, that we can... Um, uh, uh, you know, sort of expect uh, going forward. So on the one hand, you, you, we have uh, uh, new issues coming up, the litigation world and, and whatnot, which will create tension and probably limit uh, the power the governments have had until now. Uh, and, and on the other hand, the real need uh, to, to, to actually deal with this because it's not over, um, uh, unless I, I got it wrong, but I think we have a, a way, quite, a, quite a way to go. Um, so... This is creative time, guys. I really don't know. I'm interested to know from you and learn from you what you think. Um, look, I think, you know, the mandates are interesting because, um, you know, if, uh, I mean, if, if I had bubonic plague, they wouldn't let me into work, right, or anywhere. Um, there's a lot of mortality um, and therefore mandate will be very clear. Mandates, I guess, you know, become a bit less clear when 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 death rates particularly start falling um when when it's not as um serious uh, when when the different strains of, of of covid come through and are a bit less serious and and eventually kind of evolves into that so i think i think mandates are are a bit harder obviously for employers it stops people taking time off work so that's important for them um uh, but also you know you, you could argue that it's a kind of health and safety issue as well. I'm not sure how those kind of laws are being interpreted here. Um, so, you know, as, it, as, as this becomes endemic, I think, um, you know, it, I mean, you know, in, in terms of a flu jab, um, my employer provides that now. I, once a year, I can just go, it's advertised, people just go, it's not mandated, but it's actually in, close to my office. <laughs> um, that's not happening, not happening yet with, with booster jabs. Um, so, you know, if, if those kind of things become more regular, you get, you get your flu shot, you get your COVID shot at the same time, um, then it just becomes part of your kind of normal routine. And again, not everybody takes those and maybe it's only those who are, uh, maybe those people who need them most are more likely or less likely to take them. Um, but certainly, you know, we, we have to look at, 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 you know, as time goes on, properly targeting at-risk populations as well, um, particularly in aged care facilities who are always most vulnerable to any kind of um, uh, uh, infection. So I think, um, you know, it, it's really trying to get that sorted out and that hasn't been very well um, provided, um, uh, partly because it's, you know, some of that's been provided by, by private sector um, uh, and not the public sector, so it's a bit more patchy. Um, so I think that, that those are particular issues. We're trying to target it now yeah. with the particular high risk of those who are particularly at risk of, of serious complications. Thank you, Katie. Well, what are your thoughts? Yeah, just want to sort of second everything that Tony said. Really, um, really agree. Um, re really challenging to think about what you do with mandates in a setting where we are now. And when we have, you know, like in my state, we have high coverage. I mean, so there could be the logic of, well, what's what's the point of still excluding unvaccinated people from their jobs? Some of these people have like, you know, parked themselves, lived off their savings for a while, hoping, I guess, that the mandate doesn't last forever. Other people have started new careers, sort of dropped out of society, so to speak. 
you know, what, so there's, there, there, there will be people whose, you know, livelihoods and futures really depend on this, as well as even though people told us that the social exclusion from venues and stuff didn't, wasn't going to change their mind, that doesn't mean that they're not, you know, unhappy about it. And it doesn't mean that there's not also huge conflict in relationships. We've, we've found that also in our studies of people who are accepting the vaccine, you know, they're falling out with and excluding unvaccinated people from their lives and vice versa. So it's really politically and socially polarising, which has its own problems. And for as long as we have mandates, that will continue. And as we move into a setting where, like as Tony said, the disease, like, you know, once this thing is a bad flu for most people or looks like a bad flu for most people, then what's the justification for not just the mandates, but the kind of you know, the lockdown of the, you know, the ISO of the family and the close contacts and all of that sort of stuff, which we're still doing here because we're in WA and haven't even hit our peak of our first wave. Um, so we're sort of, do, you know, we're like little children doing it all for the first time over here. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so, you know, at what point do you start thinking about this differently? And then when you do, what's the justification for keeping mandates? However, one justification for keeping them is that you might want them again. And that's, you know, that's something we'd have to think about carefully, but the experience in Italy of removing a mandate in the Veneto region for childhood vaccines um, showed that when there was a scare and people stopped vaccinating, they, they stopped vaccinating quickly and more <laughs> enthusiastically in Veneto than anywhere else. Um, and certainly the Italian policymakers learned the lesson from that, that you don't take mandates away. Um, so, you know, Italy and France have both brought in mandates for childhood vaccines, well, not sort of brought them back in slash expanded them, made them more comprehensive. And, you know, work I've done on that indicates that they're probably not going to go anywhere in a hurry, regardless of what governments might say to appease populations. Um, our childhood vaccine mandates in this country are highly supported and highly entrenched. Australians do support mandates. We're a you know, a country that's, that pretty much backs them. You know, governments here do things that governments in America would really struggle to do, for example. So, you know, I, I, I do wonder, like, you know, for example, let's imagine that all the cops and teachers and maybe not health workers, they're probably a different category, but the cops and the teachers and the retail workers and the fast food workers who in my state lost their jobs, let's say it's like, oh, all is forgiven, you know, come back to work. But then, you know, then there's another variant and it's bad again and or oh my God, everyone needs a fourth dose or a fifth dose. And we've decided we actually do need that. And it is really important. Governments may wish that they hadn't taken them away, but it's, I feel like it's also not something you can just keep hanging around forever because you might need it. Thank you, Katie. Nathan, you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, look, I think the, the key issue here is the fact that we don't know where this is headed yet. It hasn't settled down. We don't know... I mean, okay, so at the end of last year, I think Australia felt like it had a pretty clear trajectory. Delta was on its way up and on its way out, and we had people vaccinated. And, you know, we were getting, you know, restrictions were being lifted around Christmas time, and, and it was all looking really rosy and, and um, positive. And sure enough, the virus has other, has other ideas, and, and, of course, Omicron appeared, and, and now we have a subvariant that's looking to carry that torch onwards further for, for further months. So the, the, the issue, I mean, the, the main, I think, um, message from that is at this point of the pandemic, it is still a distinct possibility that there will be severe, you know, significant outbreaks coupled with the now understanding. And again, because these were new vaccines, uh, we didn't know how effective they would be, and they turned out to be really effective, but we didn't also didn't know how long the immunity would last. And that obviously takes longer to understand because it's a, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a longitudinal assessment. And it is now becoming abundantly obvious that the vaccination induced immunity does wane after, you know, even three or four months. And so th this is all new information. Um, and so with that uncertainty around when's the next variant gonna come up plus, the knowledge that immunity is certainly oscillating quite markedly in any given population as people's boosters wear off, then they might have a, acquire an infection and, and have a boost in immunity, but it's almost impossible to really gauge with any accuracy what the overall level of immunity is in a population at the moment, because it's all very confusing now. I mean, when it all began, it was very simple. You're either vaccinated or you weren't. 
in Australia, and that was it. You're either immune or you weren't. No one had been infected. There was no outbreaks yet. It was all just about your vaccination status. That message was very clear and very easy to understand and mandate around because you had a very stable foundation to work from. Fast forward sort of a year and a half or so later, now it's entirely impossible to assess that with any accuracy uh, to know how vulnerable we are um, on an individual basis. Many of us have had an infection and we don't even know it probably. Many of us will be COVID, have had COVID and not be aware of the fact and, and certainly not have any sense of our underlying protective immunity. Again, all of this builds in a huge level of uncertainty. And at this point, I guess I agree with, with Katie in that, you know, it's better to have those mandates at least for the short term while we're still in this very mobile, fast changing, evolving landscape. I think giving, putting them in and taking them away just creates tension and fatigue um, in any population. Um, and, and so you're better off just dealing with it and, until it's safer not to have them around. Great. So I have a related question to this, obviously. So uh, the disappearance of, let's say, restrictions, let, let's to, to, to distinguish them from mandates, right? I mean, because uh, really um, um, maybe some people get confused restrictions as in border controls, lockdowns and so on, mandates, we refer to mandates to, to actually get the vaccine. Uh, otherwise you may uh, lose something, uh, your job or something, um, uh, you know, related to your ability to uh, uh, move with the freedom you like, uh, you know, com completely free uh, of, uh, of restrictions in, in a sense. Uh, so now, um, um, Brian would like to go to Nathan on this because it's, uh, um, uh, to me, quite important to understand, uh, uh, as, uh, and yeah, I, I, basically the, the incipit of this is really, uh, yeah, we thought in December that we were uh, out, uh, getting out uh, really of this. Um, and um, I think that has been, um, uh, you know, quite a global trend and a lot of uh, countries have, have followed on that. Uh, and restrictions, in fact, have been uh, lifted almost completely. Um, and the ones that uh, capture my attention with, with uh, respect to my, my next uh, uh, comment or questions for us to, to talk about is, uh, uh, are those relating to international travel, border, mobility, and so on? They are critical for some uh, sectors. Uh, of course, uh, you know, all of us are in education one way or the other. So that, that is clearly one um, that has suffered a lot from um, uh, the mobility levels and international movement we had before. Now, most European countries, I think, as of, of March, April, I think Italy is one of the last removing completely any restriction, even any request to test or isolate uh, uh, or whatever is the last one and it's it's, it's going to be uh, in may for anyone now um of course the science of this virus is, is still in the learning we, we don't know but um is there really an inherent risk um uh of doing that like we we saw uh in previous waves uh too soon also now or we can comfortably uh start imagining a, a world where we have learned something we have learned uh, some of the basic self-regulatory, uh, if you like, and self-management um, uh, tools. And uh, you think, and this is really uh, something that would be nice to study and understand um, whether there has been a fundamental behavioral change uh, that uh, you know, matches uh, also the change in risk, which I assume may be wrongly, uh, is distinctively lower than the beginning of this um, uh, of this pandemic, meaning that the virus, yes, can mutate, but it seems to be uh, 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 fair to say and correct me, really, because I'm curious to know that its uh, uh, its mutations are um, uh, are going to be less severe. I mean, that's the understanding, but we don't know uh, with with certainty. But we can put a, a probability there uh, that that in other cases uh, the behavior has been in that direction although coronavirus doesn't seem to behave like that. So I really ask you, given that there is uncertainty, we can quantify attached to the probability, is it safe enough really to go as far as completely uh, lift uh, any control in having people in and out and circulating and um, uh, uh, globally as, as we were before? Or should we really start planning for a, a different world for a, for a while to come rather than on a trimester basis, let's make a joke related to education. Please, Nathan. 
Yeah, I mean, all it all comes down to what you think, what your definition or of safe is, or what your acceptance of of safety. Uh, uh, look, I think the COVID nineteen pandemic has certainly changed our understanding of the impact of respiratory viruses in general on on disease across you know society. Um, you know, the, the, you used to be soldier on. Used to be, oh, if you got a cold or a sniffle, you, you just take some paracetamol and you go to work and okay um then you you know you are oh, cold's going around the office now we've all got it and you would just shrug it off and and okay some people would get very ill and occasionally some people might have an asthma attack or uh, you know end up in hospital but uh you, you, that was just the way we were edu- you just got on with it right and i think covid-19 has really revealed the the real um, burden of disease that respiratory viruses cause, particularly in those vulnerable populations that I think a lot of us didn't really acknowledge existed before. The many with immunosuppression, cancer therapy, organ transplant, the elderly, for crying out loud, who were just sitting ducks in aged care facilities waiting to get a respiratory virus and, and die, uh, essentially. That's, that's, you know, all of this stuff seemed to have been overlooked, ignored um, prior to COVID-19. This has all now been brought out into the light. And so I think certainly that's something we can no longer ignore and we'll certainly be determining a lot of how we live moving forward, uh, how and what that level of safety is that we believe is acceptable in our society. Uh, And so, um, yeah, how we um, live with that knowledge and and accommodate it moving forward is going to be a real challenge, I think, because it, it's, a, it's, it's a real total shift in our perception on, on how these transmittable diseases impact us individually, but also impact our loved ones, impact others in society that we interact with. Um, and so I'm very, yeah, hopeful that that awareness will, will, will change behaviours for the better. All right. Yes. Very, co- very complicated issue. I have a, I have a follow up for, uh, for Professor Scott Anthony. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, and it's a curiosity. I mean, I don't, I don't know if there is an answer, but at this point, um, I'll, I'll put it just out as it comes. Uh, you think it's more efi- efficient um, or effective, if you like, uh, to invest uh, in uh, one extra dose in a country with low vaccination rates, or really insist in mandates for a fourth or third booster or uh, continue uh, protecting our own populations or try to, to in fact reduce the probability of new variants to developing unvaccinated populations. Uh, what is the economist thinking around this? Because of course there is a, a, you know, a global externality issue and I thought about it many times. So I have you here, Anthony. So if you can give me your, your thinking around uh, uh, this because obviously there might be a point where it's just more efficient to really invest in uh, uh, vaccination when there is very little uh, vaccination uh, that would protect us more uh, from new variants that actually uh, protecting ourselves from uh, uh, subvariants or the same variants. Yeah, look, I mean, I think I think you're right. I think um, there is a strong argument for for equitable distribution of vaccines um, across the globe. Um, and um, you know that's been so. So you know, it obviously, it, you know, in terms of the the effects on people's health, um, it, it is more effective to vaccinate in low vaccinated populations than high vaccinated populations, where there's less protection. But also, of course, because um, we know that um, you know, in in places where where the where the virus is um, developing, that that that's where the new variants develop, and that can come back to bite the rich countries um, uh, as well later on. So I think those issues are important. They're also obviously, you know, the um, one issue I don't know if you're going to live is just the effects of, of, of vaccination or not vaccination or lockdowns and not lockdowns on the economy, um, which has been a, a huge issue as well. And, and that should also be taken into account when we're looking at the kind of effectiveness of vaccination um uh, because you know some people think there are trade-offs some people think they're not um and, and that's another issue as well so yeah thank you Kate you have some thinking uh, or thoughts uh, around these issues um we can't hear you 
Sorry. I mean, for me as a political scientist, I'm sort of, you know, would be also looking at the, um, you know, whenever an economist might think about the efficacy of particular approaches, there's always the sort of political reality of do, do we get to decide whether a dose is mandated in another place and under what circumstances, you know, no, we don't. But, you know, certainly from a social justice and equity perspective, I really want to see people in developing countries um, given equitable vaccine access and boosters, uh, you know, as those populations become eligible, um, because you know, we, because we need to, because we need to protect people in those places. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, this is very good. Well, there, there, there is um, um, a defense strategy uh, that uh, in a um, um, commentary uh, the other day in, in Italy made a parallel uh, between, uh, of course, the recent events in Europe uh, and their global response, very energetic, very timely, um, without, of course, uh, uh, entering in, in any of the merit of, the, of those uh, discussions. Uh, and it made a parallel with the COVID response, which instead has been extremely uh, uh, diverse uh, and extremely uh, led at the national level. And, and it, you know, it made a comment on the fact that, uh, you know, some of the consequences of these global, uh, let's say, catastrophes are, are uh, similar, you know, in, in, in the conflict that we're now experiencing, you clearly see it through uh, the massive uh, um, uh, exodus or refugee um, uh, you know, impacting in particular some European countries that have to face to that. Uh, and, and it is an external effect of, of uh, enormous proportion. So there are some similarities in thinking and ideas that make you think probably that uh, there needs to be a, a global response. And clearly economists and the political scientists and anyone can think uh, about these things, but there is the political reality of it that uh, comes uh, uh, to terms with this type of issues. Now, going back to the topic of today, really to conclude, um, um, it seems to me that uh, uh, part of the initial uh, discussion of today uh, really uh, brought us to, to identify, let's call, um, uh, using a Katie, Katie definition, like the real hesitance, right? Um, uh, for uh, lack of, of better, simple way, the hardcore sort of uh, uh, guys. I think um, uh, uh, that I would like to, to hear um, uh, from our speakers uh, whether um, uh, in... Um, uh, in this particular pandemic, in this pro, in this particular endemic, uh, transforming into an endemic uh, situation, whether that group um, uh, is likely to uh, stay the same uh, if restrictions are gonna disappear forever, uh, and if it's going actually to 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 uh, to grow going forward, what is your expectation, Katie? Great question. Look, it's interesting because the other aspect we've got going on here is people are getting infected. And people who get infected think that they have got immunity. Um, I spend quite a bit of time on some um, natural alternative type Facebook groups. And I do have people like that in my social network and probably I'm still a little bit like that myself, although not with regard to vaccination. Um, so I've seen a lot of discourse around, oh, you know, yay, I finally got the flu. Now I'll be immune. And I just always find that so interesting because to me, it's like jumping off a cliff and killing yourself so you don't die in a car crash it's kind of like okay great great way to get that same outcome in fact one of the, I do have to share this with the group one of them was like oh man like if only there was a way I could get in this natural immunity without getting sick <laughs> it's like oh yeah you know <laughs> someone did invent that you know anyway um so so as people so point being is that that those who get sick and you know with, for the most part will recover um no they, they're not going to have the same immunity of those of us who've had a course of vaccines so they actually don't really understand that getting sick actually doesn't you know it's not as good as getting vaccinated but you know th th there will be um the capacity for those people to kind of perhaps have some sort of immunity going forward especially if they get it more than once i guess um so I don't think that we, I, I think if there was ever a time we were going to change people's minds, it was probably at the, the time where we've got all the mandates and we've got all the settings. Some people say they've been further polarised and radicalised because they don't want to be told what to do. But I'm not expecting that many of those people would have been vaccinated anyway. And it, once they're no longer being told what to do, I'm not expecting them to rush out and do it. Um, 
I, so I think this group of holdouts, which, you know, is probably about 5% of the population, um, it might, you know, it might be more, it depends. And it's obviously a little bit bigger for, for the boosters, although, you know, that we, we can assume that most people who have had two will have three and so on. Um, is the group going to grow? That's a question that kind of comes down to, I guess, questions of political polarisation, of, of what damage have we done to the people that we locked out of society and, and kicked out of their jobs? What, what capacity have we given them to go into the arms of the far right and, and to, to conspiratorial thinking and who might they take with them? But to me, you know, what I've seen through my research of this over the course of the pandemic is there is a cleavage and you, you kind of, you get on your side and you pretty much stay there. So I don't see that movement having much luck recruiting from like the mainstream pro-vax and pro, frankly pro-mandate that where most of us sit. Um, so I don't think it's a big risk that that movement's gonna get bigger and grow. The bigger issue I think will be back to the other sort of, the other barriers to vaccine uptake, which is that kind of systemic stuff. Is it really, is it super easy? It certainly wasn't super easy for me to get my kid vaccinated, that's for sure. So how easy is it? Is government making it for people? And then, you know, again, like, you know, we, we talked at the beginning of the seminar about cost. Um, you know, we have to pay for our flu vaccines and that, that you know, I'm talking to economists here, that to me is a pretty big signal of, well, it's not that important. Um, so again, it's just going to be about what does ongoing access look like and how do we keep those rates up through those kind of boring but important strategies. All right. So pretty much no growth. I, I, I summarize. Okay, Anthony. Um, look, I think, uh, I mean, Katie's, Katie's right. I think it, for the anti-vaxxers, it's, it's really hard to do anything I think I mean you know that's who they are and what they believe and um, it's really difficult but I think we have learned a lot during the pandemic about vaccine supply about getting vaccines into people's arms a lot of that kind of a lot of that infrastructure um, was kind of emergency infrastructure we now shift that to be more routine infrastructure um, set up and that's still and that's up to states and it's varying and it's still a bit all over the place I think so I think we have learned a lot about that, but nothing is much happening, particularly with respect to boosters. So we need to get that into place, at least for, for, for those of us who do want to be vaccinated. So we can, if need be, get vaccinated much more quickly and easily. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, uh, Nathan. Yeah, look, I, I don't think I have too much more to add to, to what my colleagues have just mentioned. I guess just to say, you know, as we learn more about the disease, we haven't really spoken about long COVID either. And, and so some of these other um, uh, disease outcomes associated with, with COVID particularly, um, you know, so it's might not, it's not always just going to be, I'm just going to get a flu-like illness and then get better and, and I'll be fine. Um, you know, if your immunity is low and you're not getting vaccinated, um, then your chances of getting long COVID are, are higher, substantially higher. And of course, that has, you know, significant impacts on the individual, um, and perhaps people aren't aware of that as well. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, it, 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 it's a big unknown about where, how we 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 move forward with this in coming months to years. There's a lot of new vaccines in development. I guess that's the other thing to know is the vaccines we're talking about now are probably not going to be the vaccines we're going to be talking about next year. Um, because there are a lot of new new vaccines, those that um, uh, hopefully will offer longer protection, because that's a real big issue at the moment, isn't it? This idea of having to, the thought of having to get one every two, three, four months, I think that really, yeah, causes a lot of hesitancy, doesn't it? A lot of reluctance, just that idea of supporting that as a, a life moving forward. People aren't really wanting to get on that. So we'll be talking about different vaccines. Hopefully that'll be providing longer protection hopefully better protection across, you know, different variants, even multiple coronaviruses in the family um, or even multiple respiratory viruses. So um, again, the virus is a rapidly moving landscape. Um, you know, immunity in the population is, a, is, is, is moving all the time and the treatments and the vaccines we're gonna have are also evolving. And so all of that is part of that conversation. So that will all be evolving too. All right, thank you very much, uh, everybody. It's uh, 7 p.m. here uh, in um, um, Australia, eastern part of Australia, uh, Sydney, I would say. I'm not sure whether 
Brisbane now has a different hour, so I will I will stick I will stick to Australian Eastern Standard Time. I don't know who who else is out there and where you uh, are from. Um, thank you for joining us uh, uh, today. Thank you, uh, Professor Scott. Thank you, Professor Bartlett. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Atwell, for being uh, with us uh, uh, today and for this wonderful contribution. So for those um, who um, uh, follow us on the various uh, social media and so on. Uh, of course, you can access this conversation um, uh, online on our website um, and we'll post it, of course, uh, uh, in our um, uh, uh, media outlets. Uh, so keep in touch with, with us. And uh, uh, if you have any uh, questions or, or particular requests, send them to, to, uh, uh, to me. We decided uh, you know, to keep the format uh, to an hour and uh, that means that next month it will be a similar format, similar topic. Of course, the the the, the nice thing is that uh, Nathan anticipated the the focus would be more on long COVID and the long term effects uh, of what we are facing now. So uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, speakers that we will be revealed in time. Uh, I, I I'm, I'm still still working on it. So uh, once again, thank you for uh, your participation to the panelists and for you to join us. Goodbye. Thanks. Keep on